Now, there's a gentleman I'm about to bring up on stage, our spe second speaker of the day. I've had the pleasure, the absolute pleasure, seeing him on stage present this particular talk, maybe four or five times. He is absolutely superb. He will inspire you. You listen carefully to the tone of the man, the energy of the man, and the sheer enormity of what he has to say. You will definitely take a lot away with you today. I'm going to ask you once again, please, when they come up on stage, and do what they do the way they do it, you give them the biggest round of applause you possibly can. It gives me great pleasure at this point to introduce to you a gentleman by the name of Billy Silicani. Yes, exactly. How many of you in this room have seen Billy before? How many woke up this morning excited that you're going to see him again? Exactly. Those of you who have never seen Billy, you are going to be blown away. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome the absolutely fantastic Billy Selakani. Is it possible to be born in a poor township, to fail matric? To fail in multiple businesses, to start married life in a two-room dilapidated house with wife and son where there's one of everything, one blanket, one dish, one toothbrush, and yet increase earning ability by 10,000% in 48 months, build a global speaking business without any capital, build a 200 million rand enterprise from just 80,000 rand startup capital, be elected president of a professional speakers association of Southern Africa. Be the in-house motivational coach for Kai FM and then 2000 FM. Be honored as a visiting scholar at High Point University in North Carolina. 2009 awarded communications and leadership award by Toastmasters International, the highest designation bestowed to a non-Toastmasters. 2011 Certified Speaking Professional CSP by the American Speakers Association 2012 Inducted into the Professional Speakers Association of Southern Africa Speakers Hall of Fame 2013 Awarded the African Young Entrepreneurs Award for being a mentor and inspirational to Africans in Africa and the diaspora 2014 Recipient of the XP Award, the Oscars of the Speaking Industry in New York and give him back, working with 12,000 kids from the East Rand and the youth in Khrutpen prison. Yes, it is possible. And he will share and show you how you too can reach your dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and welcome the highest designated professional speaker in Africa, Billy Silicone, CSP. Wow, good morning. How are you guys doing? Well, I'm going to share a little bit of a secret, but it's a bit of an embarrassing secret. I'm not going to stand next to this and speak. And I'll tell you why. A couple of years ago, I had an honor and a privilege to go and speak at a big conference in Japan. So what I do when I go to different countries, I learn a bit about the etiquette of the country, how to greet, how to look for directions, and probably how to chat up the local girls, which is quite important. <laughs> so I learned that in Japan, when you greet, you say konnichiwa and you bow. So they said to me, Silicana san, this is Japan. We've got an 80 20 audience, 80 Japanese, 20% multinationals. Do you mind if we give you an interpreter? I said, ah, oh, no problem. I come from Tembisa, too many churches in Tembisa with interpreters. I can do this. So I got on stage and I put on my laptop in my left hand and there was a Japanese interpreter next to me. I bowed before I started my talk and said, Konnichiwa. And these Japanese people were absolutely amazed. Ah, oh, this one very, very good. Knows how to greet. And they started clapping hands. And when about 8,000 people give you some love, you know I'm South African, we're full of chutzpah. You want to give the love back. I bowed for the second time and something amazing happened. They stood up and gave me a standing ovation. But the challenge was, I had not yet started speaking. So I then said to my interpreter, this is very cool, man. Standing ovation before I start speaking. And his answer was, Silagane san, this is Japan. We like very short speeches. <laughs> so it meant when I bowed for the first time, I was opening my speech. And when I bowed for the second time, I was closing. So I'm not going to take that risk 
anymore next to this lectern. How many of you know this imagery? How many of you know this picture? How many of you have seen this picture many times and wondered what it really meant? Well, let me share with you what this meant to me. This was a powerful conversation had by two people. And this conversation resonated with my life and probably it will resonate with yours as well. Because every day when you wake up, our life is a story that is unfolding. And the chapters that we put will determine whether our story is a great story to tell or our story will be avoided. Now two men enter this conversation. One opens the door and he walks in. And then one says to him, ah, at last, welcome, Neo. My name is Morpheus. And Neo walks in. And he says, it's an honor to meet you. And Morpheus says, no, the honor is mine. Please, come, sit. And he shows him a seat. And he says to him, I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. And he says, yes. He says, I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who is wondering what is happening because he's waiting to wake up. And he says, ironically, this is not far from the truth. He says, you are here to see me, Neo, because there's something that has been bugging you. Like a splinter in the mind is driving you mad. It is that feeling that has brought you to me. And he asks him a very powerful question. He says, do you believe in fate, Neo? And the answer is, no, I don't. And he says, why? He says, because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. He says, I know exactly how you feel. So how many of you, through your life, you have done stuff, set yourself goals, got a mentor, got a coach, did the right sales call, you know, set up the right kind of appointment, showed up in time, fully prepared, and walk out without a say? How many of you have started a business, the greatest business plan in the world, seen by the greatest financier that said, this is going to be an amazing business, it's going to make things happen, it's going to really put you at the top of the game. You start the business, before any long distance, the business blows into pieces. How many of you have gone through that? Welcome to the club. I've been there myself many a times. But here's what I've been saying, that each and every one of us are in a state, whether this state that we're in is propelled by what society says or it is driven by our dream. Because the truth is, many of us, like Neo, we feel that we are trapped because many of us have been sold or put into a 40 years prison. I'm sure a lot of you know this very funny statement that says life begins at 40. By the time you're 40, life is gone. <laughs> it's not actually beginning. Now, why am I saying that most people are put in this 40-year prison? Here's how this prison has been designed. And this is a deliberate, deliberate design that has been created many years ago. There's a thing called the timeline. All of us are born, and eventually we will die. But what happens in the beginning and in the end, you cannot choose, but you choose what happens in the middle. Now, this system that has been worrying Neo that I'm talking about, which is called the 40 year prison, has been designed to put us in a prison that we cannot smell or taste or touch, but we're part of this prison without being consciously aware of it. And what it means, it means our life has been designed to operate in three different ages. And these ages we were given, we never chose. The first age, it's an age we call the age of innocence. Now the age of innocence is from day one when you're born up until you finish your education, degree, diploma, and stuff like that. Now, the assumption is all of us have to go through a schooling system. That's an assumption. Not all of us are supposed to go to school, by the way. It's a fact of life. You know, people like me and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, we did a little bit of university, and we didn't find it interesting, and we left. We didn't drop out of university. We left university. <laughs> I just want to qualify that. Because a lot of people might think I'm a university dropout. Me and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, we are not university dropouts. We just left university because they did not understand us, nor did we understand them. And the fascinating thing is, those universities that we left are now calling us back to teach them some stuff. Now, the age of innocence is an age, and research will tell you that when children go to a preschool, and I can see some of these young people here have been to Model C schools, you know, black guys have been to these nice Model C schools, 
which I find very fascinating because most of these blacks, they go to these model schools and they come out with a very funny accent. At some point in time, I thought they were giving them a tablet of some sort because nobody speaks like them. I mean, not even white people speak like the blacks who've been to white schools. <laughs> it's a funny thing. I mean, the kid goes to this school, her name's Dineo. By the time she finishes, she is Dineo. <laughs> I'm thinking, man, this new South Africa's got some stuff, eh? And the fascinating thing about it, because I'm from, I was born not too far from here at Tembisa. You know, when democracy came and hit our shores, I was, I was excited, saying, ah, the country's changing, we're going to see a lot of our white folks coming back to the township, because most of your finish was already in the township. <laughs> so the age of innocence, it's where you get given information. It's where you get put in a box. It's where they prescribe what kind of life you're going to live. So that's the first part of your age, where you get told by teachers what to do. Where you get told you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to read this funny story, you've got to sing this funny song, that is never going to have an impact anywhere in life. But you've got to sing this song. Humpty Dumpty, you think, oh my God, this is a crazy song. How many of you in life, when you're in a very powerful business meeting, before the CEO made a decision, reminded you of Humpty Dumpty? <laughs> Nobody. And yet our kids have got to go through this thing. Fascinating. So once you've done this schooling thing or the age of innocence, they say by the age of 25, you've got to start being productive. So you get into the productive age. Now the age of productivity, unfortunately, they do not teach you to become productive for yourself. They program you to become productive for the system. And when you get into this system, they start teaching you stuff. The first thing that they teach you, they teach you a fascinating thing called HP, higher purchase say to you anything that you want take it and pay for it for 60 months they don't tell you you're going to pay four times what you've seen they say take it and you get excited you call your friends and you put it in your house and the fascinating thing I say to my friends you know when you live in a house that is bonded the word bond is a very strong word it's like you're carrying something really heavy don't say to people they must come to your house for a bribe because it's not your house. <laughs> yeah, let's just be honest, you know, let's, let's just get the record straight here. If your bond is with APSA, say to your friend, please come to APSA's house <laughs> and let's have a bribe. Is that not true? Because it's not your house. And by the way, like I said, I'm from Tembisa. There's so many churches in Tembisa and sometimes churches sell this life of an illusion. And people stand up in front and they do this thing called testifying. They give a testimony. And somebody stands up and says, oh, the Lord is great. I've been blessed with a BMW. And everybody goes crazy. And I just keep quiet and watch them. And then some says, you see, the devil is using other people here. <laughs> Look at him. He's not happy for God blessing somebody. Then I ask them about a million dollar question. Do you own this car? If you're still paying for it, it's not your car. It belongs to West Bank. Because if you don't pay it three times, it's gone. If you can go to auction houses, most cars that are at auction houses are cars with personalized number plates. <laughs> Fascinating. Because in this age of productivity, you are sold this illusion of ownership. And ownership is an illusion. None of us owns anything but we're just given an opportunity to become stewards of things that we're given. It's about stewardship and never about ownership because ownership is an illusion. Now, during this age of productivity, they sell you products. How many of you are in the insurance business here before I get myself in trouble? All right, I'm in trouble already, I'm going to say it. And they sell you beautiful things like retirement, annuity, retirement this and retirement that. And when they sell you these things, they tell you a fantastic story that when you retire, you're going to live in a beachfront, Drive a convertible, you know, play some golf, you know, sip some margaritas, and you get excited, you start giving them the money, they take the money, invest in property, they make more money than you do. By the time you want your money, it means nothing when they give it back to you. How many of you have a father or a mother who's retired? Do they drive a convertible? Live in a beachfront house? Play golf? Sip margaritas? But unfortunately, you guys still believe the story. You still believe the story that has never worked for anybody that I know. So this age of retirement, it's when they say you've worked very hard for us, and this work that you'll do, you'll do it for 40 years. 
and will pay you 12 times. And we're not going to pay you enough not for you to come back. We'll pay you such that by a certain time in the month, you do not have the money. No matter how much you are unhappy with us as a business, you will have to come back. Because you owe, you see, you bought the 60 month story. So you've got to pay accounts and pay your car and pay APSA for their house. So you're going to show up anyway because you've got to do this thing. Now you've been paid 12 times, that's 480 times. So here's the question. If this system has been created and all of us understand that the 1%, the 5% and the 1% of the world have realized that this doesn't work and they've decided to do something different, what about you? What about your dream? How many of you have seen this movie called Pretty Woman? Some of you were dumped after Pretty Woman or you, <laughs> or you proposed after Pretty Woman. It was a fantastic movie. But I like asking people this question. There's a scene that happens twice in this movie, in the beginning of the movie and in the end of the movie, and that scene defines the whole movie. Can anybody tell me what that scene is? The woman. Come on, guys. You're not that old. Okay, let me share it with you. There's a guy who's a hobo pushing a, a trolley with a lot of his stuff. And he says, welcome to Hollywood. This is Hollywood. Everybody has a dream. What's your dream? And he moves across. And the whole movie happens, and the movie's about the dream. And at the end of the movie, when Richard Gere goes and picks up Robert, Julia Roberts, the same guy crosses back. He says exactly the same words. Welcome to Hollywood. This is Hollywood. Everybody has a dream. What's your dream? What's your dream? Because your dream, ladies and gentlemen, is the determining factor whether you will stay in slavery or you'll attain freedom. And the word freedom, is two words put together, is being free from domination. Nothing dominates you. You dominate things. Nothing owns you. You own things or you steward things. So freedom, ladies and gentlemen, is what's available to all of us. But unfortunately, too many of us have given or sold away our freedom for an installment of an expensive car. Driving a very expensive car, pretending to be very successful, having spent money that you do not have, trying to impress people that you don't even like. That's the sad thing about it. And South Africa will like our cars. If you look at the traffic, it's one car, one person per car that causes the traffic. And I still don't understand why they call it rush hour because everything is slow. Isn't it fascinating? Because South Africans like to go to work at the same time and they like to go home at the same time. Isn't it fascinating? So ladies and gentlemen, we have a choice. Either you stay in the system and one day when you're old and ugly, because when we become old, we become ugly. It's a fascinating thing, isn't it? And you're sitting in your stoop, and you look back. What are you going to tell your grandchildren? What are you going to say? You know, we were celebrating Nelson Mandela's birthday. And one of the things that really fascinates me is this man gave his life for 27 years because he believed in something. And unfortunately, some of us, some of our parents in that 27 years, they were outside. This man came out, became a president, became a world changer, statesman, who celebrated him. And sometimes we look at our parents who are really outside and ask, what did they do? But we are not the generation that's going to ask, because we are very respectful. But your Google children are going to ask you. Your Google children are going to ask you 15, 20 years from now, if you're still running after the train and your friends rocks up with a Lamborghini, they're going to say, Mom, what happened? Well, I know what's going to be the answer in the township. I was bewitched. <laughs> Somebody took sand where I was walking and he took it to Venda. <laughs> That's why my things are very slow. And of course, I know what white people are going to say. It is B-E-E. -E. <laughs> they took all my company, gave it to the guys in the township. Now I'm poor. You can either make money, become successful, or make excuses. Both of these things do not mix. Now here's what I want you to understand. You can never awaken your dream until you encounter this process or this time where you question yourself. Because here's what I want you to say to yourself. If you continue to do what you do, please do this with me. If you continue to do what you do and continue to think what you think, you'll continue to have what you have. All right, can we do it together? If I continue to do what I do and continue to think what I think, I'll continue to have what I have. Does that make sense? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is called insanity. Doing things the same way, 
over and over again and hoping that by some divine intervention, things are going to become different. And we all know they're never going to become different. So for us to go back and reawaken our dream, we've got to experience this very wonderful thing that I call a moment of truth. Because it all begins with the power of a dream. It doesn't begin with a degree. It doesn't begin with talent. It does not begin with connection. It does not begin with who you know. It begins with the power of your dream. And for you to reawaken this dream that somehow you have lost, you've got to experience what I call a moment of truth. Now let me share with you my moment of truth. Now, a couple of years ago, like most of you, I wrote an exam called Metric. Now, I still don't understand why children are put through the same trauma that was put through this thing called Metric. Do you know how traumatic Metric is? I mean, it's torture for, I mean, for what, quite honestly? So, I wrote my Metric, and the day before the results are published, there are two kinds of people that are anxious. The first group is the one that wonder how many A's do I have, how many B's do I have, how many C's do I have, and I belong to the other group. This other group that says, oh God, <laughs> let just my name appear, that's all I want. <laughs> A's, B's and C's I will see later, just my name. That's all I want. And lo and behold, the day before the, the, the results are published, nobody sleeps. We're all exceptionally anxious. We actually wake up and go to the stores and help the newspaper guys to offload the newspapers. And each and every one of us buys his own or her own newspaper. And the same thing happened to me. I bought my own newspaper, quickly paced through, searched for my name, and I did not find my name. You know, the brain is a very fascinating machine. It starts giving you funny ideas. So inside my brain, it says, this is the wrong newspaper. <laughs> So I quickly discard this newspaper and run to another township to go and search for the right newspaper. I get there, I buy the newspaper, I search, I cannot find my name. My brain tells me another story. This story says I'm too anxious. I've probably gone through this name. So let me find somebody who's got no vested interest to search for my name in this newspaper. So of course, who do you trust? The person wearing glasses. Like you, my man. Like you, my man. But funny thing about people that are wearing glasses and they do the strangest of things. So I go to this lady and say, my ma'am, my name is Billy Selegane. Could you please help me find my name? She's wearing glasses. You know what she does? She takes off the glasses, she pushes the paper this way. <laughs> is that not a strange thing? I thought the glasses were the one that makes the letters big. But no, she holds them out and she goes like this. And then she gives me the sad news. She says, your name is not here. So now I'm thinking, hmm, there's a conspiracy against me. <laughs> you know that kind of a thought. It's got nothing to do with me. So, but here's what we do. The natural inclination as human beings, when we suffer something, we want to search for the people that have suffered the same fate like us. You don't go to the symbol A, B, C, and D, you, you run as far away from them. You search for the ones that is also searching to find their names and you come together and then you throw a pity party. Have you guys been to a pity party? You blame everybody except yourself. It's nothing, it's not you. And then the sad thing happens, it dawns on me that my name is not in the newspapers, so I go home. And we Africans are very musical. I'm sure you guys know. When we're sad, we sing. When we're happy, we sing. It's just crazy, you know? We doi doi, we sing. We, we want Zuma out, we sing. <laughs> We are fighting the Guptas, we sing. <laughs> and if we cannot sing, we listen to music. So I went home and I took an LP. You know, some of you don't, you know what an LP is? It's a vinyl, you know, around like this. You guys listen to iPads and iMusic and all this kind of thing. We used to play LPs. So I put in an LP and I listened to this very powerful song. The song is powerful, but the most amazing thing about the song, it's the singer. This song is sang by a person who was born a very poor black boy and died a very rich white woman. <laughs> I'm sure you suspect who I'm talking about. <laughs> For those of you that did not read the memo, it's Michael Jackson. <laughs> now the song that I'm listening to is a song that all of you know, that have listened to a couple of times, 
but you still have not heard the message. And the song is called Man in the Mirror. Now I listen to the song and I hear these words. I am starting with a man in the mirror. I'm asking if he'll change his ways. No message could have been any clearer. If you want to make this world a better place, take a look at yourself and make the change. Wow. So I sit in my backyard and this truth hits me that if I want to make my life a better life, I've got to take a look at myself and make the change. And now the question becomes, how do I begin to implement this change? Then I remember what in that one of my teachers once said, and I can rest assured that you are told the same thing. My teacher said to me, knowledge is power. How many of you have been told that? Knowledge is power. Please go back and fetch your school fees. <laughs> knowledge is not power, ladies and gentlemen. The application of knowledge is power. Too many people know, and yet very few people do. So I said to myself, well, I need to get this knowledge so that I can apply this knowledge. So I went to a library in Kempton Park. Temisa Library had only five or seven books. You know what I'm trying to say? I mean, Temisa Library at that time, seven or eight books. One was a Bonner magazine, you know. So I went to Kempton Park, and I got into the counter, and, you know, the Tuan Bank, you know. And the Tuan Bank, there was a big tunny there, you know, the big tunny from Betchley, you know. And she says, yeah, but Suji, I said, ma'am, I want to change my life. I want to read some books. And she looks at me and says, take a seat. And after 30 minutes, she says, come with me. And she walks me into the aisle of the library. And we go past, you know, history, biography. And then we get into a psychology aisle. I'm thinking, this is not cool. I'm black, you know. <laughs> we don't do psychologists. When it's bad, we go to ZCC for the cappuccino. <laughs> or to big screen churches where they sell you Vaseline, all kind of things. We don't do psychologists, you know? And she walks me in and she shows me two books. The first book that she shows me, it's a book written by a gentleman called Dr. Norman Vincent Pearl. How many of you know that book? The Power of Positive Thinking. She gives me that book. The second book she gives me, it's a book written by Napoleon Hill. Think and Grow Rich. She gives me these two books. She says, here, go and read, bring them back in 30 days. If these two books can't change your life, walk yourself to the graveyard. Don't waste nobody's money. <laughs> As you know, black funerals are very expensive, you know, big cows and all kinds of things. So I went home and I started reading these books. And when I started reading this book, the one thing that I picked up from the first book that I read is that I have to change my thought processes. That my, 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 my thinking disposition was negative. So I get very excited about this knowledge that I'm picking up. I'm thinking there are many men and women who are like me, who've gone through the same thing like me, who can benefit from the same knowledge. And I go and I call my friends and say, guys, you've got to read this book. This is amazing. We can change our lives. And my friends look at me and say, you are crazy, man. What have you smoked today? You must change your supplier. <laughs> He's going to get you killed. This is Tembisa. This is who we are. This is what our life is all about. So forget about it. So I start reading these books. And I start getting absolutely fascinated by the knowledge that I pick up. And I start asking myself this one question. What's the difference between people that really become successful and those that live a mediocre life? Then I realize that successful people have a big dream. But a dream only without processes and systems means absolutely nothing. So I then begin to follow and read more books. What am I searching for? I now have a dream. And my dream is big and audacious. My dream is to travel the world. My dream is to have a massive house. My dream is to drive a nice car. And when I tell my friends, at that time, the airport was called John Smart's Airport. And everything was on time. <laughs> now it's called O.R. Tambo. Oh my God, the lines are long. Planes are landing too late. They take off too late. It's just a big camorce. But anyway. That's this for another day. And then I used to take my friends to the airport and show them and say, you know what? One day I'm going to be traveling the world. And by the way, at that time, there was no black person flying. So think about it. I'm sitting in the observation deck. I'm telling my friends, I'm going to be traveling the world. My friends look at me and said, you really need help. You can't be thinking this way. It's, imp it's never going to happen. It's impossible. But I said to people, it's going to happen, guys. It might take a bit longer, but I can tell it's going to happen. And I used to go to Carlton Center. How many of you remember the real Carlton Center? Not the French version. <laughs> I mean, the real Carlton Center. I mean, the Carlton Center had this men's boutique shop called Levison's. 
selling exclusive men's clothes. And one of the things that I learned when I started reading this book was the fact that you've got to begin to build a different association with the things that you want to experience. So I would walk into this shop at Levison's and I would say to this guy, you know, can I fit a couple of suits and give me a Hugo Boss? Oof, put in a Hugo Boss. Oh, the smell and the fabric. I feel, oh my God, this is cool. And I'd, you know, fit the second suit. When you fit the third suit, there's an expectation of a sale. You guys know. But I had an escape clause ready. So after the third suit, the guy's excited, thinks I'm going to sell. I go to the first suit, I say, I love this suit. Do you have it in yellow? <laughs> I know, there is no yellow suit. <laughs> the guy says, no, we don't have it. I said, man, I'm going to a wedding, the dress code is yellow. <laughs> and that was my escape clause, and I left without causing any too much trouble. And I'd go to the Carlton Hotel. You guys remember the Carlton Hotel? Now it's the Zupta headquarters. Anyway. So I'd go to the Carlton Hotel because, you know, Einstein used to say that imagination is much more better than knowledge. So I'd go to the reception and say, ma'am, my boss is going to have people coming over. I would like to observe rooms. Not normal rooms. Two kind of rooms. Junior suit and the presidential suite. And they say, wait a minute. Stand there. And then they'll come and they'll take me to the top of the Carlton. Get into the junior suit. It's okay. It's not so impressive, you know. And then they put me in the presidential suite. I am believable stuff. I have never. First time I saw a king bed was at this thing. I mean, the bed from Lapaside to Lapaside. And I'm thinking, <laughs> one or two people sleep here. The CS. I'm thinking, hey, man, my mother, my father, me, my cousin, our neighbors, <laughs> you know. <laughs> this is quite a big bed. I have never seen such a big bed in my life. At that time, in Tembisa, my bed, we used to call it dromedaris. You know the dromedaris, the, the sheep? Because the mattress, was, when it was just during the day, it was playing. When I slept, it went bing, you know? <laughs> so it was like the dromedaris. So I used to get excited, and then I walk into the shower. And I'm thinking the shower is the size of our one room. Because I was born in a four-room. You know, four-rooms were never designed. They were just measured. It was a four-by-four. Four. <laughs> four meters by four meters by four meters. End of story. And that's where we lived. And one shower was equal to one size of one room in my house. And that really blew my mind. And I said to myself, it's possible I'm going to live a life like this. I'm going to come here. And then I'd walk away. So I had this dream, ladies and gentlemen, that it is possible to experience and to be given stewardship of things, but you have to change your thought processes. And that has to be propelled by your dream. So I learned from great men and women who are successful that there were five simple principles that they followed. The first thing that these great men and women who were successful followed is they all searched and pursued their purpose. The second thing I learned from them was they were very passionate. The third thing is they consistently performed. They never were mediocre. The fourth thing is they positioned themselves very clearly with where they want to go. And lastly, they persisted because they know it takes 20 years to become an overnight success. So I'm going to share with you these five principles and I hope they're going to help you propel your life to the next level. Now, purpose is quite simply means your moment of greatness lies in your original intent. Your moment of greatness lies in your why. How many of you are in business here? Please raise your hands. Now, the question that I ask a lot of people that I consult to is why are you doing this business? Why you and why this business? What gives you the audacity to think you are going to become successful in this business. What evidence is there that you have been picking up that can validate what your mind is saying about your success in your business? And I realized that a lot of big business don't succeed because people started those businesses to become multi-billionaires. No. A lot of great businesses become successful because the, the founders of the business saw a need in society and they looked at themselves and say, does this speak to who I am, my original intent and my purpose? And if the answer was yes, they would do it. But they would do it with no expectation of making money. And the fascinating thing is success became a natural consequence of them following and pursuing their purpose. So for me, living in Tembisa, coming from a poor family, I have tried all kinds of businesses. And I remember I, I used to fail so majestically, you know. I never used to fail small. I used to fail in a big way. You know, and every time I failed, everybody knew I failed. And I said to them, watch me tomorrow. You ain't seeing nothing yet. And I remember there was a teacher 
of mine who said, I have never seen anybody that fails so enthusiastically like you do. <laughs> but then when the chips are down, after having tried many, many businesses, I went back to the truth about myself. I went back to my original intent and I asked myself this question, why? Why was I born in Tembisa? Why was I born black, not Indian? Yes, I asked that question. Why was I not born Afrikaner? Why was I not born British? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the question of papers and the question of why, we ask them at two extremes. The first extreme is absolute abject poverty, where nothing works, where everything that you touch fails. And the second extreme is when you've created so much material wealth, but you feel a sense of emptiness. Because there are a lot of people, there's nothing as common as very poor people with a lot of money. Nothing is common. Because they never pursued their purpose. They went into business for the pursuit of the goddess of profit. So I went back to my life and I wanted to find out what is this common thing? What is the common thread in my life that can point me to a direction that will at least answer my why question? And I found this. As you can see, I was anorexic at some point in time. When I found this picture, I started asking the question to a lot of people that, where was this? What was I doing? How did I do it? Did people enjoy it? Then I started finding a lot of pictures of the same thing. In a beauty contest, in a 21st birthday, I said to myself, wow, this is fascinating. So I have the gift to connect with people, to whisper not to their heads, but to their hearts. So if I can take this and cultivate it and work on it and build it, I can be able to ease other people's pain by showing them a direction that they've forgotten about their lives. So there and there, I knew that I had to follow and pursue this career. So some of you have a business now. It's doing okay. It's not doing bad. Some of you have tried a couple of businesses and they keep exploding in your face. This is the time for you to ask your question. Is what you're doing in the direction of your purpose. Because sometimes a good plan is not God's plan. You know, it's fascinating. It can be a good plan, but it's not God's plan. Because each and every one of us were created with an original intent that you came here to fulfill this one particular thing. And that thing only you can do. And the sad thing about us is many of us will lose our purpose because we measure ourselves against other people. People measure themselves against the success of other people. People measure themselves against what other people are doing. But unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, that will limit your growth, and that will limit who you can become. I'm just thinking about it. When I had my S in metric, everybody thought, you know, I was right off. That was the S. You know, I, got a, I had an S in metric. It means school living. It means don't show up next to an educational institution, go lap aside, drive a taxi, do all kinds of things. But as far as education is concerned, that's the end of you. Okay? And a lot of people wrote me off. It's cool. They wrote me off. I understood. But when I found my purpose, something magical happened. There's this thing called providence. I don't know if you guys have heard the word providence. When you find your purpose, providence begins to move. Suddenly things around you begins to happen. People show up and begin to help you without even knowing where they come from. Has that ever happened to you? When you get to that level of your life, when men bring unto your bosom enough for your need and for the needs of others, you know that you're being used for that which you've been created for. So I'm asking you now, have you questioned your original intent? Have you questioned why you are where you are today. And I believe if you go back to your life, you'll find the answer. Because the sad thing about it is, we all want prestigious things. We all want nice suits, nice air conditioning, nice cars, nice this. I could imagine, if your son came to you and said, I wanted to become a baker. A baker? Are you kidding me? Some kids are becoming doctors and lawyers. You want to bake cakes? But how many of you like cake boss? Ah, you like cake boss, isn't it? And that's his purpose. Yeah, just think about it. His gift and his why is to bake super amazing cakes that puts joy in people's hearts. And that's all he's doing. And the consequence of him doing that, we all know. Unfortunately, we live in a generation now where all our children want to become Kardashians. I mean, I keep wondering, who are these people? What do they do? I don't know what they do, but they seem to be very famous. And everybody wants to be like the Kardashians, and I don't know why. But I believe that the unhappiness that we're experiencing in life today, the sadness, the breaking down of families, the failing businesses, is because most of us have neglected to ask ourselves, why are we here? Some of us, we know our purpose, but we think it's below us. Because we've seen somebody else doing something, 
that we think if we do the same thing, we'll become successful. It's not the truth, ladies and gentlemen. I build a very powerful business, travel the world. I work in over 30 countries. I have an S in metric. I'm the highest designated professional speaker in the continent. I get called to universities to lecture. Why? Because I find that one thing that I was called to do. And when I, once I found that thing, everything, my mind just opened up. When I started reading books, I just understood them just like I'm thinking, oh my God, my teachers were wrong. My teachers were wrong. They were supposed to have given me a distinction at metric. <laughs> but if they gave me a distinction, I'd still be at university and you wouldn't see me, isn't it? That's a good thing they did to me. So the first thing is purpose. And the second thing is these men and women that find their purpose, they're very passionate. And when I speak about passion, most of you think about Valentine's Day, Red Roses, Teddy Bears. Now passion finds its original expression in Greek. The word passion in Greek is called pashko. What it means, it means the willingness to feel the pain for and the willingness to die for. So each time I hear people that say they're passionate about their job, I say, oh really? <laughs> You're passionate about your job? Let's see you working four extra hours a day without any promise of an overtime. Quickly the passion disappears. Quickly the passion disappears. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Nelson Mandela said it quite clear that he wanted a South Africa where everybody's equal, where we treat each other with respect, where your character determines where you go. He said this was an ideal that he was willing to fight for, but if it was necessary, it was an ideal for which he was prepared to die. That is passion. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to stop doing now? What are you willing to say no now to so that you can say yes to the big and the great thing that is waiting for you? If you're not willing to apply passion in your life, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you now, 20 years from now, you'll remember this day and you'll say, I could have. But here's what I know. Most men and women that are successful, that have created beautiful things in life, they never did it without passion. It takes pain to get to where you want to go. Because I say to people, anything in your life that you have achieved that has not cost you any pain, it's not worth keeping. Because it will disappear soon. So I learned that the second principle that this man and woman applied was the principle of purpose. The third one, of course, is performance. Now, performance is fascinating. That every one of us, when we wake up in the morning, we get given a stage. Every morning. And when you get given the stage, you get given the same time like everybody. 1,440 minutes. That's all we get given every day. Now the question is, are you a great performer or not? That's the question that you've got to ask yourself. When the stage is set in front of you, how do you show up? How do you perform? Are you the kind of guy that will always go home and regret that you couldn't have done A, B, C, and D? Or are you the kind of guy that's going to go home and say, today I woke up and I killed it. I made it happen because I performed. Now, performance is a fascinating thing because in this country, sadly, we accept mediocrity in every part of our lives. We think it's okay when you get to a restaurant and they don't give you the food that you want at the time that you want. They don't give you the drink that you want at the time that you want. We think it's okay. It's not okay. How many of you have been to the U.S.? Now, the U.S. is a fascinating country. You pay a tip whether the person is good or bad. And they've got 15, 18, and 23 percent. So they just tell you. So I was in New York quite recently, and this taxi cab just was a, was a disaster of a guy. And one time for me to pay, he said the tip, I said, no, I'm not giving you a tip. And I told him why. And I said, I'm going to trip advisor now. I'm going to write about you. Thanks to social media. He begged me, he did not take my money. Because I did not accept his performance. I did not accept for the fact that he thinks I'm from South Africa, that in South Africa we climb elephants when you go to work. Well, that's what a lot of Americans think, you know? And when I come, they say, oh, you're from Africa? I says, yes, they say, you might be lazy. But I say, why? So you're big, man, you're very lazy, you know? You don't run too fast for your food, you know? So you eat enough <laughs> so that you don't have to search for food. Because they're quite naive, you know, Americans. I love them, dear God, but they are very naive people. Now, you know, we see a lot of this enhancement drugs doing the rounds, yes? Steroids and all these kind of things. Now, the number one selling drug in the world is Prozac. You know Prozac? Prozac is the make me happy drug. You know, when you're unhappy, you know, the husband has disappeared with a miniskirt, you don't know what to do, 
You see a psychologist, they prescribe and you go and get Prozac and suddenly, ooh, life is beautiful. That's the number one drug in the world. And the tenth top selling drug in the world is fascinating. It's Viagra, number ten. I'm being serious. The market value is $10.8 billion. But I'm here to see a man who accept that they ever bought one. But it's a performance enhancement drug. That's why it sells. Because, ladies and gentlemen, all of us have to perform each and every day. Like the stage that you get given, the question is how do you perform? Because each and every one of us will get a stage. Now, I travel the world. This is a local stage. But the question is, how many times have you been given an opportunity and never seized it? Garbe diem. How many times has an opportunity been put in front of you and you never performed because you never felt the confidence inside of you to do what you knew intrinsically you had to do? Because confidence is not a look, ladies and gentlemen. Confidence is an emotional state. It's what you feel inside that exudes outside. That is confidence. And we can never become a great nation unless... We hold each other accountable for performance. Until we do, until when you go to a department, they don't treat you well, you put it on social media, we back you up, we name and shame, people don't perform, we, we're going to keep being a mediocre country. We've got to start performing. Because every day, your life depends on it. Because here's the deal. I don't think when you go to a doctor, you go to a doctor who's not sure what they're doing. Do you do that? You know, my personal doctor, I always laugh at him. I say, you know, you doctors, you put your certificates, but you don't tell us what percentage you passed, you know. <laughs> Maybe you passed by just 51%. 49% of the time is guesswork, you know. I say, put the marks there so that we can know if you're a good performer. Oh, no, Debbie, you know. <laughs> and, and, and what I find fascinating about doctors' places, they call them practice. Think about it, you're sick. You go to a place called a practice. Really scary, isn't it? So he's going to practice with you. <laughs> and if he gets it right, he'll save the sixth person. <laughs> so you're going to be part of the guinea pig. It's fascinating. They call it practice. I don't know how they call it practice. You know, like the gym. You know this gym called Virgin Active? It's an oxymoron, isn't it? How active can virgins be? But anyway, people go there, you know. <laughs> and the fascinating thing about gym, I do go to a gym. I do visit a gym once in a while. It's true. Why do you go to a gym? You think I don't go to a gym? But when I go to the gym, I don't frustrate myself with the six-pack guys. And I'm never going to have a six-pack anymore. It's never going to work. So one day I was there and I asked this guy, say, hey, my man, what kind of machine impresses women here? This guy says, the machine that impresses women is not inside, it's outside. ATM. <laughs> so each and every one of us have to hold each other and ourselves accountable for our performance. And the fourth principle that I've learned from this great man and woman is how you position yourself. A lot of people call it branding. You know, branding is too blasé and too many bells and whistles. But I talk about positioning. Where do we find you? Where are you found? Who do you hang around with? I say to people, show me five of your friends and I will tell you how far in life you will go. If five of your friends are broke, you're the sixth broke friend. It's a fact of life because we find each other. Now, for me, when I started in the speaking business, I realized this one profound truth. For me to get to the next level, I had to network one step up. And I'm saying to you as a business person, don't network at the same level with you. Network one step up because these guys up here have made it and they will do this and they will lift you up. So what I did, I met up with this great group of guys. One of them is going to be speaking here today. And I became part of an international mastermind group. Raj Athwal is based in Dubai. Steve Simpson in Australia, W. Mitchell is the gentleman in a wheelchair, great story. You guys know the movie Avatar? It was written based on his life story. Great guy from the USA, and this gentleman here, you're going to see him today. And most of the things that he's going to be doing, I taught him, you know, so when he... <laughs> he's my WEE, -E, White Economic Empowerment, you know. <laughs> Go to give something back to the brothers, you know. <laughs> so I started connecting with this group of people. And I can promise you, all of them had been in this game much longer than I had been. But something amazing about this group of people, each one of them asked me this one question. What can I do to help you go to the next level? That's all they asked me. Very powerful question. 
Very generous question. Because ladies and gentlemen, unless you position yourself with great men and women, you'll keep being mediocre. You'll keep playing for the B team. You'll never get to the A team. And as my career grew, I then connected with, an, with another great man. And we call him the Oracle of High Point, Dr. Nido Kubain. Powerful guy who's the president of High Point University in North Carolina. Took over the university in 2004. Between 2004 and 2015, raised a billion dollars to make that university one of the most sought after school in the South. Amazing guy, was my coach. Now let me tell you a story about Nido Kubain. So people say, get a coach. I come from the US, I'm excited from a conference. I heard him speak, I said, wow, this guy's amazing. People say, get a coach. I phoned a couple of people and I ended up phoning his office. So the PA picks up the phone. I say, ma'am, I'm calling from South Africa. Quickly tell him my story. And I can hear her saying, Nido, you've got to listen to this boy. Nido comes and says, who are you? I say, my name is Billy Selegane. You know, I saw you speak. I want to come and learn from you. He says, well, can you be in Atlanta in two weeks? For two weeks. Thinking, yeah. Here's my email. Send me the details. And he sends me the details. He says, come to Atlanta and learn from me. Pick up my suitcase, pack the course material, humble yourself under me, and learn, which a lot of people are not willing to do. A lot of people are not willing to humble themselves in front of those that have walked the path ahead of you, sit down and drink from their well of wisdom. So here's what I did. Unfortunately, at that time, I had a credit card with a certain bank, and my limit was only 10000 So I calculated, going to Atlanta, Georgia, the ticket would be about 7200 One night at the hotel would be about 1800 I calculated to every cent. And this two-week session was happening at the Grand Hyatt in Atlanta. So I calculated from the airport to the hotel how much taxi fare, how much tip, and stuff like that. By the time I got into my room, I only had $8 left. And I'm supposed to be there for two weeks. So I picked up the phone, and I called this bank. I said, ma'am, could you please double my credit, and I'll pay it back in 30 days. And you know, most banks don't know your name, they know your number. You know, they look at your numbers, they think, Icon, this is from Tembisa. Are you from Tembisa? Say yes. No, 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 we can't do this. You Tembisa people don't pay. You know the story. You Tembisa people don't pay our credit. No. I said, ma'am, could I speak to your supervisor? So the chain goes up until to the manager. But each time they pass the phone, you can hear the, the whispers, you know. He doesn't qualify. And then they give the manager. Now the manager, before I, I say, sir, before you say anything, please listen to my story. So I said, before I tell you my story, I want to ask you a few questions. If I may, he says, yes. I said, how many kids do you have? He says, three. He said, how long have you been working? He says, 15 years. I said, what is your eldest child doing? He says, my eldest child is just doing his second year at university. I said, okay, sir, listen to me. Many years ago, this business that you work for was an idea. It was just an idea. And the people or the person that started this business went through too many doors and knocked and asked for help. And many doors were shut. But one door opened for him. And that one person that gave him the opportunity and listened to this person and gave him the money to start has made it possible for you to take your child to university. All I'm asking for is make it possible for me to learn so that this knowledge that I'm going to learn here, I'm going to bring it back to South Africa. And together, me and you will make this country a better place. And then I did the craziest things. And I said, here's the fax number of the hotel. You can fax the acknowledgement of debt. I will sign it and fax it back. And I dropped the phone. And I said, Phew. And I started thinking, do I pray like a Roman Catholic church? Do I pray like a Lutheran guy? Or do I pray like the Christians that are making noise? How do I pray that this thing happens? But, you know, here's what I know. When you're telling the truth, not with your mouth, but with your heart, people feel it. And when I told this guy the truth of my situation, I did not talk to his head. I spoke to his heart. And in exactly two and a half hours, the concierge knocked at my door. And there was the acknowledgement of debt. And I signed it. And I stayed with this man for two weeks. And my life changed. But here's what happens. After the two weeks, he says to me, what have you learned? We we'll go through an assessment. He says, so what is the next level? I said, well, I would love for you to become my coach. And he says to me, well... It's $25,000. I said, let me go to the toilet. <laughs> I don't know, have you had such bad news that you want to, you know, I went to the toilet and said, oh my God, I'm going to die. I needed water, all kinds of things. 
And I came back to him. So I started calculating $25,000. So was $320 something thousand. I'm thinking, oh my God, I've just asked for $10,000 extra. Where do I get this money? So I went back to him. I said, do you, you know, do you do monthly payments? <laughs> I'm South African, what can I say, you know, take a chance, you know, tata my chance, you know. And he looks at me and he laughs and says, I have never had anybody say that to me. He says, how do you do this? I say, okay, 25,000 divided by six months, I pay this, this. He says to me, here's the deal. I'm going to give you five months to pay my money. The first month, you're not going to pay me. You're going to start paying me on the second month. But he says to me, if you apply only 65% of the things that I'm going to teach you, you'll pay me back my money in three months. I'm thinking, okay, this is very interesting. And I said to him, wow, you know, let's try this. He says, no, 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 I don't try things. I do things. If you want to do this, don't try. Do it. And then he said to me something very profound. He said to me, I'm going to teach you one simple technique. It's called zero-based thinking. He said, I want you to go back to South Africa. And begin your business as if it's the first time you're doing this business. Forget everything and anything that you know. And start from zero. And he gave me five strategies to follow. In two months, I paid him back all his money. So ladies and gentlemen, you want to get to the top of your game, begin to associate yourself with people that are on top. Listen to them. Apply what they teach you. And I promise you, your life will never be the same again. The last principle that I've learned from these men and women is persistent. That you're not going to walk out of here, find your papers, be passionate, perform, position yourself, and things are going to happen. Sometimes it's going to be tough. Sometimes that big deal that you knew was in, suddenly it's gone. The guy was supposed to sign it, was fired, or left, or something went wrong. I had something happen to my business four years ago where I sold a lot of my time to one company for a good amount of money. Didn't sign a contract, gentleman's agreement. And when thing be things became bad, overnight the CEO was gone, the whole business had changed, and nobody knew about me, nobody was willing to honor my agreement, so I went back to ground zero. Do you understand what ground zero is? Ground zero is when you've got 42 rand and 99 cents in your bank account, and it is the 24th. And you know by the 25th, David orders are come running. You know by the 27th, you've got to start making things happen. You know by the 30th, you've got to play your employees. That's ground zero, ladies and gentlemen. If you have never been to ground zero, you are going to go to ground zero. It's not how many times you grow to ground zero, to ground zero. it's how many times you have the audacity to stand up and face it up. And the fascinating thing is, as your life progresses, as you build your business, learn this one profound principle. Be a seed sower. Sow seeds of greatness in other people's lives. So that when you hit bottom, you pick up one number, you call, you say, this is what I need. They say, how much, when? They never ask you when you're paying it back. That's when you connect with people at the great level. That's what happened, because it is going to become difficult. I like this picture. Why do I like this picture? Because there's no way that this young man is going to push this. But he doesn't believe it. Nobody told him it cannot be done. He did not read Google. He, was not, he didn't listen to 702. Nobody told him he was going to do it. How many of you know a bumblebee? A bumblebee is this, I'm sure guys from the township, you don't know, let me explain it to you. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, in the township is fascinating, guys. You guys must come to the township, please. Don't go only when there's a blue bulls. You must go, you know, and don't go to Chisanyamas only. Come to the real part of the township and learn the culture, because it's fascinating. You know, it's like seasons. You know, black people have got only two seasons. Summer and winter, and spring day is the first of September only. Then from there, it's summer. You know, that's how we roll. <laughs> We don't have this autumn and, you know, spring is just one day. First of September and then we're in summer. You know, we don't have autumn and these fancy things. So the fascinating thing about it is a bumblebee, according to the laws of aerodynamics, it shouldn't be flying. But they did not send it the email and told it. So therefore it flies. And that's the thing about success, ladies and gentlemen. Most of you, you'll never become truly successful because you were told you're not worth the success that's available. Because you were told you are a woman. Because you were told you are a black girl. Because you were told you are a white guy. Therefore, South Africa, there are no opportunities for you. Here the be, Menzel Khan, alles fat. That's not true. Don't believe what you hear in the news. Believe what's in your heart. Because your heart is more powerful than information that comes externally. So you've got to persist. Because it's not going to be easy.
you will fall. Not once, not twice. A couple of times. But it's not how many times you fall. It's how many times you dust yourself up and get to the game and make it happen. So all these men and women that I have studied, that I spend time with, that I research, are men and women who understand that you have to be persistent. If you're not persistent, you're not going to make it. You do not deserve to get to the top of the line if you're not going to be persistent. I like the speech earlier on that people that fail are the ones that must be considered because they know what it means not to have. When you get to that level in your life, when everything just disappears, when there's nothing that you can depend on but yourself, that's when your greatness shows up. And I believe that most of you need to get to that place in your life when you can depend on nobody else but the power that's within you. And when you get to that level, ladies and gentlemen, things will begin to happen. Now, the power of your dream will be driven by the foundation of your dream. What is the foundation of your dream? Why do you do what you do? I'm going to simply share some pictures and show you the foundation of my dream. That no matter how tough things become, this is where I find my anchor and my strength to live. And this is my wife. The first picture was the first Christmas we had together. And the second one, we tried to take over and capture Bangkok, but it did not work. They deported us back to South Africa. That's why I'm back here. Now, for me, my anchor is having this woman who, when she was pregnant, we could not afford 25 cents to get into a taxi. When she used to come to my place, we'd fry one egg and share it. But I'd keep telling her, you're going to live like a queen. It's going to take time. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take sacrifice. But when the time comes, you will not want for anything. And she looked me in the eye. She said, I believe you. That's all we need. You need just one person to look you in the eye and tell you they believe in you. And when that happens, ladies and gentlemen, magic begins to happen. And this, is what, this was a time when Philip was here. You remember 2010, Philip was here? <laughs> As you can see, my family sold out. They were all Portugal fans, and I was the only guy who was favoring Cote d'Ivoire. But this is what happens. When you have an anchor, and the thing about success, ladies and gentlemen, it's not a spectator sport. You don't sit in the grandstand and go and pick up the gold medal. You don't do it on your own. You need a powerful team behind you. Without a team, it becomes quite difficult. And since this team has become so strong, we now have a new addition. There it is. He's now five years old, an amazing guy. And the fascinating thing, I was in the US and I showed this picture. I says, wow, that's a very lovely. Did you adopt the last one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm not my daughter. I can't afford to adopt children. <laughs> Americans think we can adopt like Madonna does. And when it is tough, you know, it's not easy to travel when it's tough. There's too much traffic, you know. I don't like traffic, you know. So once in a while, <laughs> I do not experience traffic. And I'm showing you this not because I'm saying I'm better than you. I'm showing this to make you understand that anything that your heart believes, that you work towards, it's achievable. It is just a question of time. And this is how the 1% fly. Fascinating thing. Yes? It's a beautiful thing. Here they call the wine by its name. On the other side, they just say red wine or white wine. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so all of us, ladies and gentlemen, can reach the greatest peak in our lives, but we have to find that greatness inside of us. We have to search inside. We've got to connect with the right kind of people. We've got to hold on and meet great people. And this is a great gentleman I met in Philadelphia, Billy Paul, the famous singer who passed away, who sings me and Mrs. Jones. And when I met him there, for the fact that we shared names, we spent four and a half hours talking about our experiences. An amazing guy, great wisdom. And this is a beautiful place in Philadelphia, which is one of the pinnacles of black music history in the world. And this, of course, was when I was picking up the XP, which is an equivalent of an Oscar in the US for the speaking, for the speaking industry. And, you know, of course, we like the first black thing, you know? But yeah, I became very nice. I said the first African, you know? <laughs> I could have said the first black man. I thought the first black man thing is too much, but I said the first African. So what am I saying to you? And here, it's very profound. Now, this is the statue of Dr. Norman Vincent Pell. This was in New York two weeks ago. This is the first book written by this man that I read, which completely transformed my life. Go and find the book. It is still relevant. It is still very transformational. But remember reading it and knowing it and understanding it means absolutely nothing until you implement what is written in this book. 
Because once you implement what's written in this book, you'll be able to make things happen. Now remember our first story with Morpheus and Neo speaking. And Neo saying, Morpheus saying to Neo that everybody feels like a prisoner. Now comes a, a time in this movie where Morpheus is working with Neo and he explains to him this concept of the Matrix. And he says to him, the Matrix is our enemy. When you're inside, what do you see? Dr. Sness is businessman. The very minds of the people that we're trying to change. But until we do, they're still a part of that system and that makes them our enemies. He says, you've got to understand that these people are so in aid, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. Now, as he teaches this guy very powerful principles, Neo's attention shifts because there's a woman in a red dress that passes. And Morpheus says, were you listening to me or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? He said, I was. He said, look again. And when he looks, the picture has changed. Now, how many times have you been focusing on what you needed to do? Working on this powerful plan and doing this and suddenly a distraction comes and you shift focus. You don't focus anymore. By the time you come back here, things have changed. How many times has that happened to you? Then Neo asks him a question. He says, is this part of the matrix? Morpheus says, no. It's not part of the matrix. It's another training program designed to teach you one thing. If you're not one of us, you're one of them. And he points at this guy. And Neo asks, who are they? He says, they're sentient programs. They can move in and out of any software, still hardwired to their system. Which means that you can have people around you that pretend to support your vision, that pretend to support your dream, but in essence, they want to sabotage your dream. You've got to be aware. You must have this high sense of spiritual alertness to be able not to listen with your ears, but to listen with your heart. Because, ladies and gentlemen, not everybody around you wishes you the best. Not everybody around you wants you to become successful. Not everybody around you wants you to close that great deal that you're searching for. But you've got to be aware of these things. And he goes on and says, I will not lie to you, Neil. Every man and woman who's fought an agent, every one of them has died. I've seen an agent pass through a concrete wall. Men have emptied entire clips of them and hit nothing but air. And yet their strength and their speed is based in a world that is built on rules. A world that is built on rules. The 40-year plan. So a lot of people are playing the 40-year plan. If you play the 40-year plan, you get the same results the 40-year plan guys get. But you play a different game, you get different results. So ladies and gentlemen, the choice is yours. You've got to look at your life and ask yourself this one profound question. Am I going to keep trying to do this one thing that has not worked for anybody that I know? Or are you going to begin to look at your life differently and say, you can find your greatness. You can become the best that you're going to become. Because at one point in time, this thing must happen. Your fears and your dreams will collide. And the bigger of the two becomes the winner. If your fear is big and your dreams are small, your fears will obliterate your dreams. But if your dreams are big and your fears are small, your dream will become true. Because ladies and gentlemen, all I can say to you, all I want to say to you, it all begins with a powerful dream. I wish you the best. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the fantastic Mr. Billy Silicani. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how to treat a rock star like an absolute rock star. Billy, as always. Good champion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, Billy, before you go, a very big handshake on behalf of everyone in the room this morning. You're honest, you made us laugh, you made us think, and most importantly, you've inspired how many people in this room, right? Thank you, Billy. Thank you. You're a champion. Thank you. So what did I tell you, folks? Those of you who hadn't seen Billy Silicani before, if you ever ask that question again, you are never going to forget that name. Am I right? Absolutely inspirational. You know, it's always amazing to watch people like Billy. I'd love to know what really inspires Billy on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm going to ask him. Because to be that inspirational and that full of energy and full of that absolute power of positivity and hope, there must be something very powerful that drives you too, Billy. Do you mind? Can I ambush you? What inspires you on a daily basis? You get up in the morning and you think, right, this is what I'm doing today, but you've got to be inspired. Well, I think what, what inspires me is for me to become an anchor for the possibility of an African child. To show an African child who today does not have food, is walking barefoot to school, to say to this African child, it's possible. You just have to believe. 
You just have to go and do the right kind of thing. Meet the right kind of people. Work hard. It is achievable. That inspires me. It's a great answer. There we go. Thank I'm you. glad I asked. I really am.